I would like to start with this picture. And of course, you have to guess what is the relevance of this particular image? Who are the persons there? In fact, these persons, they represent what we are talking about today. Because these two persons are Edwin Drake and Charles Darwin. And uh, the point is that these two persons were at the root, were at the origin of two different industries. Of course, Edwin Drake, 1859, the first modern oil well in uh, Titusville, Pennsylvania. Charles Darwin, the same year, 1859, just by coincidence, the origin of species. We all know that Edwin Drake's invention translated into a new industry very, very quickly. But sadly, Charles Darwin's fantastic insight that all species are related to each other, and in fact, he forecast also that we all share the same DNA sequences, the same genetic language. This was something he forecast through his discovery. His book, his discoveries did not lead us into a new industry until many, many years later. And I think that what this conference will be all about is how Charles Darwin's legacy builds a new industry alongside with the oil industry and perhaps eventually catching up with the oil industry. But we learned that the oil industry will go on for at least 50 additional years. So, life science is at the heart of this new industry that we can, in fact, trace back to Charles Darwin and 1859. And life science, when did the concept of life science, in fact, come about? And I think it's fair to say that this particular book, which I read time and time again with much admiration, was, yes, at the root of life science. Because Erwin Schrödinger, a physicist, and the one who lent his name, of course, to Schrödinger's cat, Erwin Schrödinger, during the Second World War in 1943, he gave lectures under the title, What is Life? And his prediction was that there will be a day when physics, chemistry, mathematics, not least, would come together to enable us to better understand what is life and what is distance. This is, in fact, the essence of life science, that different disciplines come together to provide a better understanding of what life is. This book reads as well today as it did in the 40s. And mind you, this was before Watson and Crick came up with the DNA double helix. So this was a visionary piece of work. And now, of course, the legacy of Alan Schrödinger is exactly what you see here. Lifswitenschaft, life science, it's simply where all these different disciplines come together. And not only do they come together, but they are integrated in a seamless fashion. That's the secret and challenge behind life science, how to integrate these different disciplines. And if they are well integrated, we know that life science will provide new insight advances within all these different fields that are shown at the bottom of the slide. Cancer, green industry, vaccines, Alzheimer, nanotechnology, the list is endless. But what are the challenges, what are the possibilities for our own country? And when I say our own country, we all have dreams. I'm sure you all have been to Kendall Square in the Boston area. Fantastic. Because here, Schrodinger's vision has been realized to the full extent. In Kendall Square, the most innovative square mile on the planet, many people say, and I think they're right. Here, all the different stakeholders come together. Industry, healthcare sector, academia, education. You have all these ingredients at one spot. And I think this is a secret that we all have to go into. That proximity is so important. 
that all these different stakeholders are within reach of one another. And I will come back to that later. But I was very pleased to see the model of the new university hospital here in Stavanger because proximity is exactly what we will achieve when the new hospital will be put very close to the university campus. This is the proximity we need in order to generate industry from life science. So this is what uh, the conference is all about on the homepage of this uh, conference. And I think the themes are very well selected, carefully selected. These are some of the most important issues also from the perspective of life sciences in Norway. Perhaps I miss uh, sensor technology along with robotics, and uh, perhaps I miss a few other things. And the few other things that I miss will in fact be the core of my presentation. Because these are the issues that I will be dealing with. And I've selected these issues also because I know that some of these issue, issues will not be raised by the other speakers. Of course, the goal is to translate life science research into transformative change and benefit for our patients and for society. And of course, the challenges are numerous, and we have to exploit the potential and the power of uh, life science adequately. And at the University of Oslo, we have these five E's in mind when we develop our strategies for life sciences. And I should say life science is the most central initiative that we have taken over the past 30, 40 years. So it's really a pillar of our strategy for the moment. And when I say plus a P at the bottom, it's simply because, again, I will stress proximity, that the different disciplines are close to one another to improve and facilitate interaction. So these are the three E's, education. We must educate science polyglots, ethics, very importantly, we'll come back to that. Equitability, just and fair distribution of health services. Europe, a metaphor for internationalization, obviously. And then engagement across sectors. We need to work in a way that allows technology and talent and ideas to flow between the different sectors in our economy. And this is a major challenge for life sciences. So, First, education. We must educate science polyglots with an entrepreneurial mindset. What is a science polyglot? A science polyglot is a student or a scientist that commands the languages of several disciplines. This is not a straightforward task. And it means that we have to change of our educational system, reform of our educational system. Yesterday, in fact, I'm sorry to say this because that was Pentecost, I was deeply embedded in a research project that engages my entire group, research group. And what we were doing was simply to model and simulate the movement of water and solutes between the cells in the brain. Perhaps this comes as a surprise to you, but the brain produces waste products all the time. And these waste products, they have to be cleared in order for the brain to function properly. So there is a sanitation system, a sewage system in the brain, and this is what we're looking at here. So yesterday, we were looking at how water passes through the brain using advanced computer simulations, and in fact, some of the equations that have been used to simulate water flow through porous rocks for the oil industry. So we can see how disciplines come together. And this must be done in a much more effective manner than we are managing to do today. This is one of the challenges of life, of life sciences, to adopt and adapt the technologies used in other disciplines. So what have we done in practice at our university? In fact, at the, mat at the mathematical and natural science faculty, the entire portfolio of study programs have been changed so as to open for simulations and computing 
And this is very important because the students then can also engage in research projects very early on in their studies. And computing in science education is also now included or will be included throughout biology. So simulations like the one I showed you in the previous slide will be something that can easily be carried out by many research groups. So I think education and the reformation of education is a critical step towards the life science industry in Norway. We are also then collaborating on uh, innovation programs in, um, in health and in life sciences with other institutions. We have a new school of health innovation that uh, is a school that is run in collaboration with NTNU and the Karolinska Institute. And by the way, I will take over as rector at the Karolinska Institute from 1st of August this year. And it's very important also to note that when it comes to education, one has to differentiate between two lines, as it were, that are not distinguished properly in many campuses. And that is that we have to go for I capacity, innovation capacity among the students, but also E capacity entrepreneurial capacity. And uh, these two skills that require different study programs and different kinds of expertise among our teachers. We have been criticized quite recently over university, and I think perhaps all the universities could stand to have the same criticism as well. And that is that we are not really managing to work in an interdisciplinary fashion well enough. We have a strategic advisory board led by Esko Au, the Prime Minister of Finland many years back in time, and they told us in no uncertain terms, and you can look at the arrow, that we should move more in the direction of interdisciplinarity. This is a major challenge for a university, but we are slowly getting there. This is in Norwegian, I'm sorry about this, but in fact, when our campus was established in the 30s, the Blinner campus, Peter Oxet, who was the sort of um, mastermind between the design of the campus, he said that, yes, we have to have a campus where the two cultures meet. And it has taken us almost 80 years to start to realize this vision. But now things are happening. It was nice to see the dance at the beginning of uh, this conference. In fact, what we are seeing now, for instance, in this case, is that expertise developed within the humanities are transferred now into medicine, just to take one example. These two guys, on the Daniel Snell Alexander F. Sumian Senius, they developed sensors that could be used to trace the movement of arms and legs and the whole persons when they dance to music. And now the same technology is being used in medicine to diagnose movement disorders among children. Wow, this is the kind of thing we need to erode the silos between the disciplines. And uh, what we have, what we're trying to do now also is to let the professors move from one unit, one faculty to another, perhaps to have a dual affiliation and I think this, again, is something that is, will facilitate the development of life sciences. Ethics, extremely important and very often forgotten. Technologies are nothing worth unless the society are prepared for them. And now we're talking about biotechnology, of course, information technology, all the technologies that come together to form life sciences. And I would like to illustrate this point with one person. Perhaps you know who this is? Yun Bing. He was professor at the uh, Faculty of Law at the, at the University of Oslo. And he understood very early on that when it comes to one very important technology, information technology, you cannot really harvest and benefit from this technology unless you have laws and ethics that tell us how this technology should be exploited and utilized by society. So he, in fact, pioneered the law governing information technologies. 
And he was also very concerned about the ethics revolving around information technology. I think that we in Norway have to take a lead when it comes to the understanding of the ethical challenges when new technologies are being inserted into the society. And this goes, for instance, for targeted genome technologies that are coming up now with the CRISPR technology in particular. As I say here, too often we see that technologies acquire a foothold before society becomes equipped with the wisdom to use them prudently. So life science industry has to take into account that there must be an ethical fundament of all the different technologies that are being acquired for the forming of a new economy. Equitability, just and fair distribution of health services. Later today and tomorrow, there will be a lot of discussion about precision medicine, about advanced medical procedures that are extremely costly. And I think it's extremely important to keep a balance here, to strike a balance. And the balance is all about also caring for those that haven't got any access, affordable access to health care. We must have a focus on this issue as well. Mind you, when we're talking about precision medicine and uh, technology-based medicine, we should keep in mind that five billion people on this planet don't have access to safe and affordable surgical and anesthesia care when needed. This was the result of a Lancet report that was published a short time ago. Imagine two out of three persons almost have no access to affordable surgical care. And uh, I could go on. If you look at the uh, childhood mortality, there are tremendous differences between different parts of the world. And look, and good luck for us, we are at the top when it comes to this partic particular parameter. But you can see the ch differences here that are simply unjust. So one of the things I've done personally is to head a global commission, a Lancet commission, where we looked into the political determinants of health to see what can be done with our governance system, globally as well as nationally, to help alleviate these dramatic differences that we see when it comes to health care. So how do we motivate for political change? This is one of the things that also belongs to the realm of life science broadly defined. And of course, if you are into life science, one has to care about the sustainable development goals. And of course, these goals are spot on when it comes to the need not only to identify the unjust inequalities that we face when it comes to healthcare services, but also when it comes to how to alleviate them. Point four has to do with internationalization. I think the politics in this country has been far too, far too much centered on the national arena, particularly over the last few years. We have to improve significantly the uh, exchange of ideas and expertise with the outside world, where 99% of the knowledge is produced, in fact. And then we have to go into, in particular, the EU's research programs, which I think could provide a boost to the life science industry and life science research in, us, in, in Norway, if we handle this challenge correctly. We are part of a, a network of research-intensive universities. We had a meeting in Brussels just a few days ago in the Solvay Library. And what we discussed is exactly this. How do we influence the European Union's research programs for the benefit of life science? And how do we harvest properly from these programs? Our presence in Brussels is mandatory if we are to succeed in building up a strong life science industry in Norway. And again, the sustainable develop development goals will figure prominently in the future strategy of the European Union when it comes to research funding. 
Also, there are some news that are very interesting because the synergy grants in the European Union will be relaunched very soon. And the synergy grants are a fantastic opportunity for life science because the synergy grants do exactly what many of the other funding systems don't do. They couple the disciplines together. They go for interdisciplinary research, like life science research. And of course, it's not only about uh, Europe, it's also about the Nordic countries. And I think that there will be quite a lot of discussion here uh, during this conference on how we could pull together better in the Nordic region. Because there are ample opportunities to really be much more visible on the international scene. For instance, when it comes to management of health data, biobanks, cancer treatments, clinical trials, and so forth. And Chetri Biedeberg just recently had a, an article on this in one of the major newspapers. And uh, very often when I talk about internationalization, I refer to this paper in Nature by David King. Because what he says, and we should take note, is that if the small and northern European countries, and he's talking about Nordic countries, if we really pull together, we would be in the premier division. And the premier division is the division where we find Germany and the UK. So there are ample opportunities to strengthen the Nordic collaboration. So the last point, engagement, the need for surprising alliances, the engagement across sectors. What we did a few years ago was to publish a report called the, the bio Badi report that really looks into how we could get these four sectors to collaborate much more intensively when it comes to the exchange of technologies and talent. I think this is uh, something that we should really have a close look at in Norway to see how these different sectors, industry, health, marine and agriculture, could uh, collaborate much better than they do today. We simply don't have this flux of talent and ideas between these sectors that we ought to have. One example dating back a few years that show the potential of having data, findings, results flowing between the sectors. One example of this is uh, what is shown here, how insight in genetics helped save quite a lot of costs in the uh, aquaculture industry by identifying those genes that provide resistance to the infectious pancreatic necrosis virus. This virus takes a great toll on the economy of the fishery, so it used to do this until the genes that provided resistance were found. This is an example as to how talent and data could move between sectors for the betterment of uh, the respective industries. And this was supported by uh, the Fuge program, which was in fact a basic research program originally. Finally, the P for proximity. This is from a talk that was given by Tim Rowe not long time ago at a life science conference at the University of Oslo. And, uh, well, you could say that perhaps some of these uh, figures, I will show on all the slides as well, might be seen as controversial, but they are interesting. Because what he said, and he referred to Kraut and Aguido, um, research report from the uh, uh, Bell Communications Research, that uh, the frequency of collaboration between scientists is driven by the distance between them, between the, the collaborating scientists. This is, of course, from the US, so the same thing might not necessarily apply here, but it really matters a lot whether scientists are located closely together or not. And this is also interesting from also Tim Rowe. He says that, and referring to another uh, study, that uh, if you are close to another researcher, for instance, working in the same building, the outcome of your research will have a greater impact than if you are working with somebody at a distance. So it all 
goes in the same direction. Same direction. Proximity is essential. And this is the principle that we are there to also at the University of Oslo. We are building a new life science complex now. It will be ready, completed in uh, 2022. And uh, it's located between all these different disciplines that are required in order to build a strong life science environment. So you can see at the top there, the life science building at the top right is located very close to the hospital, as will be the case here, that the university or hospital will be very closely knit together physically. And uh, it's very close to the informatics uh, department. It's very close to different technology departments, nanotechnology departments and so forth. And this is exactly what we need in order to get the disciplines to interact seamlessly. So proximity is of central importance. We also just bought a spot close to the life science building to uh, have an arena for a better interaction with industry and startup companies. And of course, the ecosystem of innovation in our own city in Oslo is uh, pretty extensive, and many of these different stakeholders are represented also at this particular conference. And I should say that uh, one of the most important things, as I see it, when it comes to life science and the prospect of having a strong life science industry is to have a competent tech transfer office. And uh, Invento is uh, our TTO, and uh, these are the uh, figures from 2016, and we are seeing a progression that goes in the right direction with uh, an increase in the number of exits, increase in the number of, uh, in the access of private capital, and also, as you can see, many clinical studies that are going on. Again, something that is essential, an essential platform for the development of a life science industry. Of course, uh, what we see very often is that one success leads to another. The Algeta success, of course, was instrumental in paving the way also for other companies. And we have many new companies now that are promising. I will end with, uh, yeah, what should we say? An anecdote, but still very important. Because what we are all doing here in this conference is to try to look into the proverbial crystal ball. We are trying to come up with predictions about the future. But you see, or we all see, we all understand, this is not that easy. Because all of a sudden something unexpected happens. In the, by the end of the 19th century, one of the big challenges globally was the scarcity of nitrates. You couldn't really get enough nitrate to, to help fertilize the soil. And this was a challenge that loomed large at that particular point in time. But then all of a sudden, and this is serendipity, Christian Birkeland, a physicist at the University of Oslo, developed an electromagnetic gun. I guess many of you have heard about this. And uh, the experiment with this gun went wrong. So there was a short circuit, and uh, there was a tremendous explosion and the electric arc that was formed because of this failed experiment. But this electric arc was, was what it required to harvest nitrogen from the atmosphere. Nobody could predict this. But this was a result of serendipity. Samaida, of course, understood that uh, this electric arc could be instrumental in capturing nitrogen from the air to then produce fertilizers. So Norsk Hydro was established because of this, and now the uh, production of fertilizers is carried on by Yara, as you know. And in fact, Bent Høyer should have been here because he took part in a discussion with Bill Gates and uh, myself in Gamle Festsal, the old festival hall at the University of Oslo, a few years back in time in 2014. And Bill Gates, when we invited him to Oslo, he said that, I will come, but on one condition, and that is that Birkeland's electric arc, or Birkeland's gun should be present in the auditorium. Because as he said, 
Birkeland's electric arc helps sustain billions of, of people on Earth. I mean, this is really life science, isn't it? But nobody could predict it. I will not take part in this debate unless the electromagnetic gun is there with me. This is what Bill Gates said. Amazing. And the reason I mention this, of course, is that Christian Birkeland is to be celebrated this year, 150 years since uh, he was born and 100 years since he died in Tokyo. And he, even though he was a physicist like Schrödinger, he was the real role model for life sciences because he did exactly what life science does, combining theory with experimentation, simulations and calculations. And he's my favorite professor also because he spent his own money to carry out his own research. <laughs> that is a thing that the rector likes to see. So the last uh, issue, yes, the Menon, uh, Menon reports, they have been referred to already, they give us a promising picture of the future. And uh, we have several uh, white papers, the minister referred to one of them, Helsomsorg or Healthcare 21 strategy, that also can muster political leverage to ensure that we get a good life science future in Norway. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>